Welcome to Assessment of the Nose, Mouth and Throat for School Nurses. I'm Elaine Willette. I am the Northeast School Nurse Regional Liaison for the Maine Department of Education. My goal today is to teach you new information and skills that you can use in your school health office. Today we'll discuss taking a history, review of anatomy, assessing the nose, mouth, and throat, assessing the lymph nodes, and documenting your findings. A good history is really important. The assessment will confirm or not confirm what was told to you in the history. Ask a lot of questions, including where does it hurt? What makes it better? What makes it worse? Do they have allergies? When pollen counts are high, students with allergies will often have symptoms that are similar to a cold. Ask about a runny nose, a cough, difficulty swallowing, speaking, or breathing. You may want to know whether the person had general feelings of severe fatigue before the sore throat started that may indicate mononucleosis. Assessing vital signs gives you information about the student and if abnormal, can alert you to an illness or a health issue. So let's start with the nose. Assessment of the nose begins with inspection. Normally, it's the same color as the rest of the face with no redness or discoloration. Look for symmetry of the cartilage. Asymmetry suggests a fracture that could be due to an old or recent fracture. Look for swelling or malformations. Look at the opening of the nostrils. Are they symmetrical? Uneven nostrils are most often the result of a deviated septum and are associated with frequent nosebleeds and congestion. To start the assessment, use your gloved hand and gently elevate the tip of the nose as shown in the slide. Use the pen light or a light from your otoscope to illuminate the nasal cavity. Nasal mucosa is normally pinkish red in color without discharge or bleeding. Look to see if there may be a perforated septum. Also make sure there's no foreign body in there. You never know what those little ones can put up their nose. Check for airflow by occluding one nares at a time and ask the student to take a deep breath through their nose. They should be able to inhale without any obstructions. If you see discharge, note the color and consistency of the discharge. As you know, nasal mucus is your first line of defense against infections. Normally, mucus is clear. An increase in this clear watery discharge is often due to allergies. White mucus means there's inflammation of the nasal tissues. This inflammation slows the mucus, causing it to lose moisture and become thick and cloudy, giving it that white appearance. Yellow mucus usually means the start of a cold or infection, and its color comes from dead white blood cells. Greenish mucus means your immune system is working harder and contains many white blood cells and other cellular debris. Mucus that becomes brownish could be from dried red blood cells and inflammation or as a result of inhaling something brown like dirt or cigarette smoke. Sometimes coughing up brown mucus may indicate bronchitis. It's normal for the mucus to get thick and change color, usually becoming darker as the virus or cold progresses. You can't tell based on the color of the mucus alone whether the infection is a virus or a bacteria. Small amounts of pink or red mucus usually indicates irritation of the lining of the nasal cavity from either excessive blowing or rubbing of the nose, or sometimes irritation from cold, dry air. 
Saline spray and a humidifier can usually relieve these symptoms. Discharge that lasts longer than 10 to 14 days or any foul smelling discharge that is associated with a fever, headache, cough, the person is still feeling sick or a fever, especially over 101, should be referred to the medical provider. When documenting, normal findings could be documented as the nose is symmetrical and free of edema or discoloration. Nasal mucosa is pinkish red without discharge, swelling, malformations, or foreign bodies. Abnormal findings might be documented as nasal mucosa is bright red with purulent green discharge. As you know, you're going to document what you see. There are four pairs of paranasal sinuses. Only the frontal and maxillary sinuses are accessible for the clinical exam. The frontal sinus located in the forehead area does not develop until the child is around seven years old. The maxillary sinus is the largest and is located behind the cheek between the upper teeth and the eyes on the side of the face. To palpate the frontal sinuses, you're going to uh, use your thumbs, place them just above the eyebrows near the midline of the forehead and press firmly. To palpate the maxillary sinuses, you're going to place your thumbs just under the cheekbones, lateral to the nose and press up on the maxillary sinuses. If there's a feeling of slight pressure, that's probably normal. If the student experiences pain or severe tenderness, especially if it's associated with other symptoms like pressure around the eyes or cheeks or a headache, or if it becomes worse when bending forward, those are indications that you probably should call the parent and recommend a medical evaluation. So let's practice. When you do the clinical assessment, let's assess the frontal sinuses, Place your thumbs just above the eyebrows near the midline of the forehead and press firmly. I'm doing it upside down on myself, but when you're doing it on a student, you're going to put your hands forward. So you palpate the frontal sinuses, and I always do it twice, probably a half inch apart. Press and press. No pain, you'd go to the maxillary sinuses, lateral to the nose, you're gonna press up, and I also do it like a half inch apart. I always press twice just to assess for tenderness to make sure I'm getting the right spot. Normal findings might be documented as no frontal or maxillary sinus tenderness. The nose is patent with a good airflow. Abnormal findings might be documented as left maxillary sinus pain is a six out of 10, 10 being the worst pain that they could ever imagine on a scale of one to 10. Next, inspect the lips for symmetry, color, and moisture. The color of the lips can give you a lot of information. Pale lips could be a sign of anemia. Bluish lips could indicate hypoxemia. Hyperpigmented lips, could be a sign of Addison's disease. Dry, cracked lips could indicate dehydration or a fever. And canker sores could be due to stress, eating a lot of acidic foods, or from minor injuries to the mouth. If you see drooling in a young student who doesn't have a history of drooling, look for a cause. Sometimes it hurts too much to swallow, so they don't swallow. Some infections like tonsillitis or strep throat can cause hypersalivation and drooling. Let's look at the differences between a canker sore and a cold sore. Both appear in or near the mouth, but they're very different. Some people call cold sores 
fever blisters. They're a symptom of a herpes simplex virus type one infection, which is more commonly known as oral herpes. It's generally contracted during childhood from non-sexual contact with saliva, either through a kiss or by sharing utensils when they're eating or when you're sharing food with the child. If someone has a history of cold sores, they should know that the virus can remain inactive and reactivate when it's triggered by a, some kind of a stressor, either a cold or flu, fever, excessive sun exposure, stress, or even hormonal changes. Cold sores typically appear as a painful blister or group of blisters and are most often found outside the mouth and around the lips. They're very highly contagious. Younger children may have them inside the mouth, which can make it difficult to differentiate from a canker sore. It's not always black and white. Cold sores drain fluid throughout the duration of the infection, usually about seven to 10 days. There's no cure for a cold sore. However, there are medication that can relieve the pain and soften the crusts on the skin. A canker sore is a small rounded ulcer that appears only inside the mouth or inner lip. It can appear alone or in a cluster and the cause is unknown. Different things can trigger an outbreak such as food allergies, stress, hormone changes, vitamin deficiencies, infections, or even eating spicy foods. Canker sores are not contagious. And interestingly enough, they're more common in girls compared to boys. They usually first appear between the ages of 10 and 20, but sometimes occur earlier. Students should avoid spicy foods to prevent irritating the sore and could use a topical analgesic such as Orogel to numb the sore and ease the pain. Cleansing antiseptic gargles or rinses sometimes can help. Next, have the student open their mouth. The gingiva is darker in students with darker skin. Look at the tongue. It should be pink and moist. Some causes of a white tongue are poor oral hygiene, mouth breathing, or dehydration. White patches on the tongue and inner cheek could be a sign of oral thrush, as seen in the first picture, which is a fungal infection that looks kind of like cottage cheese-like plaques with areas of redness. A geographic tongue has reddish spots with white or gray borders and is an inflammatory but harmless condition that affects the surface of the tongue. The dorsum of the tongue is normally covered with tiny hair-like projections called papillae that protect it. People with geographic tongue lack papillae and the tongue gets the appearance of a map, hence its name. You may see students with geographic tongue in your health office complaining of discomfort because there may be increased sensitivity to certain foods like spicy, salty, or sweet foods. If there's pain or discomfort, their medical provider can prescribe mouthwash with an antihistamine or a topical analgesic to relieve the pain. A very red tongue could indicate a variety of things, including folic acid and B12 deficiencies, and indicates a phone call to the parents. A rare finding could be a black discoloration of the tongue, which results when the papillae on the tongue grow longer and bacteria and debris can collect on the tongue, resulting in a black furry discoloration called black hairy tongue, which is usually temporary and harmless. In my nearly 25 years of school nursing, I only saw two cases of this. Black hairy tongue usually resolves with good oral hygiene. 
brushing of the tongue. Certain types of yeast and bacterial infections can also give the tongue a blackish type appearance, as can injecting, ingesting Pepto-Bismol. It's important to ask the student if they've recently taken Pepto-Bismol if you see a black discoloration of their tongue. On this slide, I just wanted to review the tonsils, which you know are lymph nodes in the back of the mouth that help filter bacteria and viruses to prevent infection. The pharyngeal tonsils are also known as adenoids. The lingual tonsils rarely cause problems, but the palatine tonsils commonly become enlarged and inflamed, especially in youth. Swollen tonsils that aren't painful or don't cause any other problems usually don't need to be treated. Inflammation of the tonsils or tonsillitis is most often caused by viruses, but can also be bacterial infections. The most common bacteria causing tonsillitis is group A streptococcus, the same bacteria that causes strep throat. A student that has a sore throat associated with a fever, difficulty swallowing, and malaise, or symptoms that don't go away within 24 to 48 hours, as you know, should be referred to the medical provider. Before you start your assessment of the throat, pay attention to the student's breathing. If you hear any difficulty breathing or strider, do not examine the throat because if the student has an acute airway obstruction from epiglottitis, this may be provoked. If there's no strider, you'll want to get a better view of the back of the throat. Place the pen light in your non-dominant hand and the tongue blade in your dominant hand. This gives you better control when you're looking in the mouth. Look at the teeth and in the cheeks, look for dental caries or abscesses, look at the hard and soft palate, have them stick out their tongue, have them say ah while you watch for the rise and fall of the uvula. As they say ah, the uvula should stay in the center. It shouldn't go from one side to the other. Press your tongue blade to visualize the back of the throat and look at the tonsils. Make sure not to stick it too far back or you're going to elicit a gag reflex. When the student's mouth is open, also pay attention to any odor coming from the mouth. Bad breath could be due to dental caries or from an abscess or some type of infection. Pharyngitis is an inflammation of the pharynx, commonly known as a sore throat. Pharyngitis is a symptom rather than a condition and can be caused by either a viral or a bacterial infection. Rhinovirus, adenovirus, influenza, coronavirus, and RSV are the most common viral causes of a sore throat. There are a handful of bacterial etiologies of pharyngitis, but group A streptococcus is the most common. Other causes of pharyngitis or a red throat can include allergies, dry indoor air, chronic mouth breathing, gastroesophageal reflux or GERD, and fungal infections from students who require immunosuppression, chronic steroids, or long-term antibiotics. The treatment of pharyngitis depends on the cause. A sore throat caused by a virus, as you know, will go away by itself. With salt water gargle, extra fluids, and pain relievers to help with the symptoms. Bacterial pharyngitis is a referral to the medical provider because it needs antibiotic. So how do you know? How do you know if it's a virus or a bacterial infection? How do you know when to refer to the medical provider? The short answer is you don't know. 
You want to notify the parent when a student complains of a sore throat and inform them of your assessment. If the throat looks really red, suggest making the appointment as soon as possible. If the redness is mild, you can let the parent decide if they want their child to see the medical provider or wait and see if symptoms get better or worse. I've seen sore throats that barely look red, test positive for strep. And I've seen others that look like those on the slide that are negative for strep. So you never know unless you, they are tested. What are the signs and symptoms of strep? We know that strep is the most common bacterial infection in the throat and the tonsils. Common findings associated with strep throat include rapid onset with a fever, usually over 101, difficulty swallowing, pharyngeal edema, redness and swelling of the tonsils with or without exudate, palatal petechiae, anterior cervical lymph node enlargement, an inflamed uvula, and sometimes a bright red rash that covers most of the body known as scarlatina. Students may have one of these symptoms, all of these symptoms, and sometimes they don't have any of the symptoms. Strep infections are more commonly seen in children ages five to 15, as you know, are more common in winter and early spring, and interestingly, will not typically be associated with a cough, runny nose, or hoarseness. Here are pictures of three typical findings in students with group A strep. The top one, strawberry tongue, which are bumps on the tongue that resemble a strawberry. Tiny red spots on the roof of the mouth called petechiae, as seen in the middle picture. And the lower picture are white patches or streaks of pus on the tonsils. As I said earlier, these are typical findings of students with group A strep, but your student may not have any of these symptoms and still test positive for strep. When do you refer to the medical provider? Well, if your assessment shows any typical symptoms of stress that we discussed, milder symptoms that don't improve in five to seven days, symptoms that are getting progressively worse, or if you see the typical rash as shown in the slide, suspect strep and refer to the parent and recommend that the student see the medical provider. Sometimes the student just looks ill and you know something's not right, even if you can't find anything physically wrong. Trust your gut. It's always better to refer and the test come back negative than to not refer a potential positive case. If the parent lets you know that the strep test came back negative and the child shows no improvement or is getting worse, suspect a false negative test result and ask the parent to bring them back to the medical provider. Sometimes if they do just the rapid strep test, it does not identify the bacteria and a culture may be indicated in that case. When you call the parent to refer the student, use that opportunity to educate parents on primary prevention strategies that include good hand hygiene, especially after coughing and sneezing, respiratory etiquette, and staying home from school until a febrile and until at least 12 hours after starting appropriate antibiotic therapy. The guidance in the past was to stay home for 24 hours after starting antibiotics. The guidance has changed and now it's 12 hours after starting antibiotic therapy, as long as they're a febrile. You also want to ask custodial staff to disinfect high touch areas in the school and the classroom where the positive case was. You don't need to report group A strep to the CDC unless you have a case of invasive group A strep. 
Invasive strep occurs when the bacteria gets into parts of the body where the bacteria usually are not found, such as in the blood, the muscle, or in the lungs. You also want to report if you have a cluster of cases, several students in the same classroom or the same area of the school. If you're not sure if you should refer, give them a call. They can answer your questions. There are two main conditions of the throat that can be life-threatening. One is epiglottitis and the other is a peritonsillar abscess. Epiglottitis happens when the epiglottis swells and blocks the airway. Epiglottitis used to occur mainly in children and was usually caused by Haemophilus influenza type B or HIB as we commonly know it. Now most children are vaccinated against HIB and epiglottitis is quite rare, but it's still a cause in adults and unvaccinated children. So you need to be aware that it sometimes can happen. Symptoms can develop within hours and progress very rapidly. Signs of epiglottitis include difficulty in painful swallowing, the student acting very anxious and irritable, and you'll often hear strider, that high-pitched sound that is more prominent during inspiration. The student may speak in a muffled voice, and you may also see drooling. Symptoms may improve when sitting up or leaning forward, the tripod position, because that enhances airflow. If you see any of these signs, it's considered a medical emergency. Call 911 and call the parent immediately. A peritonsillar abscess is a collection of pus that usually forms near one of the tonsils. The abscess is not common, but causes significant throat pain and is usually caused by streptococcal infection that has spread from the tonsils deeper into the tissues. The student usually has difficulty to speak, swallow, or breathe. In most cases, it will require surgical drainage and antibiotics. Let's look at a few key points of the sore throat. Most sore throats are caused by a virus and resolve without treatment. Occasionally, sore throats are caused by certain bacteria, particularly streptococci. It's difficult for doctors to distinguish a viral from a bacterial cause of a sore throat without doing testing. Abscesses and epiglottitis are rare, but a serious life-threatening condition can happen. So let's move on to lymph node assessment. Lymphadenopathy is the term for swollen glands or swelling of the lymph nodes. To examine the lymph nodes in the head and neck, use the pads of three fingers on both hands. Examine both sides of the head simultaneously as shown in the second picture on the slide. You want to palpate in a circular motion and apply steady gentle pressure as you're palpating. So you're gonna start palpating in the front of the ears using circular motions, preauricular area, move to the back of the ears, postauricular area, move to the back of the neck, occipital area, down underneath the jaw, submandibular, submental, start at the jaw, move down the neck, examining the cervical lymph nodes, and you're going to end with palpating the supraclavicular lymph nodes that are located above the clavicle. Lymph nodes are normally small and soft. When you feel well, they're about the size of a bean or a kernel of corn, but they can become enlarged and sore when they begin fighting an infection. So let's practice for a minute. Let's check our lymph nodes. 
the pads of three fingers on both hands, you're going to use circular motions and apply steady, gentle pressure. Start in the front of the ears, circle circular motions, post auricular, back of the ear, back of the neck, occipital, down under the jaw, submandibular, submental under the chin. Start again at the jaw line, go down the neck, the cervical, and you're going to end with supraclavicular right above the clavicles. It only takes less than a minute to do the assessment of the lymph nodes, but it takes practice to become proficient. Lucky for you, sore throats and colds are very common and you'll get lots of practice in your school nursing office. So lymphadenopathy can be caused by different things, neoplasm, inflammatory conditions, or infections. However, enlarged glands are usually your body's immune response to a virus or bacteria, and usually go away without treatment, as you know, or after treating the underlying cause or infection. Often the lymph nodes that swell are close to the site of infection. Swollen lymph nodes are associated with other symptoms, including sore throat, earache, fever. Swollen glands that don't resolve on their own or within two weeks should be evaluated by the medical provider. Redness over the skin, over the enlarged lymph nodes may indicate an infection and needs a medical evaluation. You can see in the first picture on the slide that there's redness over the lymph node and usually that indicates an infection. In some students, lymph nodes can be quite enlarged and easily visible and sometimes they're more subtle and can only be identified by palpation. And sometimes they're not palpable at all if they're not enlarged. Lymph nodes that are one to two inches or bigger, lymph nodes that continue to grow, or if they're hard and unmovable, are not normal and should be evaluated by the medical provider. Healthy lymph nodes are more rubbery than the surrounding tissue, but are not solid like stone. If you feel something hard and firm, notify the parent and recommend a medical evaluation. How do you document enlarged lymph nodes? You document which lymph nodes are enlarged or which area the lymph nodes are enlarged and where they're tender. For example, submandibular and cervical lymphadenopathy with tenderness bilaterally on palpation. Or if you can't palpate any enlarged lymph nodes, you may document something like no enlarged or tender lymph nodes in the neck area noted. If you're an experienced school nurse, you've done many assessments of the nose, mouth, and throat. If you're new to school nursing, you will do many assessments throughout the year. Trust your gut. Notify parents and refer as needed. I hope this presentation was helpful and that you will continue to practice your assessment as you see students. Practice your skills with any student that comes into your health office that is ill. The more practice you get, the more proficient you will become. Happy assessing. Thank you.